Kaupa, Miss Mercy H. Kaute, and Dr. Lalwat Kima. We are very privileged to have them with us, and they are going to talk about border issues from a wider perspective, some of which may be new for many of us, and we hope to have a fruitful discussion after their presentations. And to begin our first technical session, may I invite our respected Vice Chancellor, Professor R. P. Vadera, to deliver a welcome speech. Over to you, sir. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lalipuri Pachal, for your uh, introduction. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, to all of you, uh, distinguished. Uh, faculty members, heads of the various academic departments of ICFI, and the participants uh, in uh, today's uh, international webinar on uh, uh, on a very, very important uh, topic and relevant topic which has been troubling uh, not only Mizoram, but whole of the Northeast. But these border issues, that, uh, they are more in the Northeast, but the whole country, Walling, has been uh, facing this kind of uh, situations. <laughs> oh. Sorry, your mic is being muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, let me uh, uh, say uh, again, these border disputes are not uh, only there in the Northeast. This is the, 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 uh, the phenomena all over the country. Whenever any big states get uh, bifurcated into smaller states, uh, as is the case in Northeast uh, with Assam. And uh, when I look into this, uh, Assam has the border uh, issues, disputes with almost all the Northeast states, all the other six states, Mizoram, Nagaland, Arunachal, and uh, Tripura, and uh, every state it has its dispute. And, uh, uh, and uh, as far as the other states are concerned, there are uh, uh, these uh, conflicts uh, on the border of this, but the uh, most serious issue which uh, at present is confronting us is the, uh, the dispute, the conflict between, uh, the, between uh, Assam and uh, Mizoram. Now, these, uh, these uh, boundary disputes are not something new. They are as old as uh, the human civilizations. When you look into going to the history of India, I think uh, 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 even after uh, uh, after independence specifically, uh, we find uh, we had uh, very serious issues are falling. When we, uh, this uh, lots of uh, princely states, they had joined India and then uh, reorganization of, of uh, India into this reorganization of the states. So lots of things had happened and uh, this most of uh, this reorganization of the states have happened uh, between uh, 60s and uh, 70s or 80s or five. And uh, this, uh, uh, even when I, I belong to Punjab, even Punjab also, I think 1966, when it got uh, bifurcated into Haryana as well as uh, Himachal, these were part of Punjab, Greater Punjab after independence. So Punjab also have some disputes with the Assam, the Saimachal. It also has disputes with Haryana, but they are uh, amicably are falling through discussions 
they are trying to address those issues. I think uh, uh, although our efforts, uh, all peace talks are to resolve this conflict uh, with Assam have not uh, been successful, that does not mean they will never be successful. We have to keep on trying. But at the same time, I think uh, we have the systems in place, so we must uh, place confidence uh, in the ability to resolve this conflict. A few days back, I was uh, listening to the news uh, uh, that conflict because many states have been bifurcated. UP has been bifurcated uh, uh, this, uh, into two states that Uttarakhand has come out of it. And uh, UP is behaving very, very, very nicely with Uttarakhand. They are addressing that uh, their secretary, chief secretaries are having lots of meetings. And they have already this uh, ensured that in a very peaceful manner within one or two months, they will be able to address those issues. So got bifurcated, UP got bifurcated, Bihar got bifurcated, this uh, Jharkhand, then this uh, Madhya Pradesh got bifurcated that uh, Chhattisgarh has come into. And uh, recently, that Andhra Pradesh also got uh, bifurcated, Telangana has come. Or falling whenever any state uh, gets bifurcated into, into two, two smaller states, I think these issues, uh, they, uh, they always come up. But then maybe uh, in case of Mizoram, so this uh, is, uh, the issue is uh, much before than the bifurcation of uh, Mizoram from Assam that uh, in uh, 1971, if I remember correctly, it was uh, upgraded. Uh, it was a maybe auto autonomous district cons council and then later on in 1971, uh, that uh, UT and 1987 as a state. But this issue has been confronting us from the colonial period. But uh, this, uh, I don't know what has gone wrong or falling. I think uh, we have to have a situation, address this issue, maybe like uh, 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 in leadership, we say that uh, we have to create con conflict re resolution. There is one situation called win-win situation. I think so that Mizoram also does not feel that, that it has lost the war and Assam also does not feel are falling. I think that efforts have to con be continued. But at the same time, I think uh, the, that uh, I do uh, agree that uh, this, uh, the police of uh, this, uh, both the states are falling. I think uh, they should not take this law and order into their hands. I think that was not fair on the part of uh, Assam getting into that disputed area. Falling the status quo can be maintained and the efforts in this direction can be continued. I, I'm sure that uh, time is not very far when this issue will will get uh, peacefully resolved, okay? This uh, political science, he will give the political perspective. And uh, he's a very experienced scholar who has uh, lots of uh, uh, experience in the field of research. He has done lots of publications, uh, books, and uh, lots of uh, research papers. Then we have another, uh, and my, another, uh, another old colleague, Dr. Casey. He is from a geography background. He also is a great researcher. He has seven, eight books uh, to his credits. He has uh, more than maybe 20 papers. And uh, he will give, uh, as far as uh, this uh, Professor Dongol is concerned, he will be talking on border disputes in Northeast India. He will be giving political perspective. And as far as Dr. Casey is concerned, he's an associate professor in the geography department of Israel University. So he will be talking on geographical perspectives on border disputes with special reference to Mizoram and Assam. Yes, geographical perspectives are falling in uh, hilly areas. I think uh, uh, it's very difficult to fix uh, this kind of, uh, the boundaries are falling very, very clearly demarcate this. There will be always some confusions, but in the plain area like Punjab and Haryana and this are falling, it was much easier to demarcate the boundaries of the new states. So uh, Dr. Casey will uh, give the geographical perspectives of the border disputes. And then we have uh, another young uh, lady, uh, Madam Mercy K. Khate. Uh, she has uh, uh, lots of exposure. She has uh, been the alumnus of uh, uh, a college there in uh, Calcutta. Then uh, she was a student of also alumnus of uh, Delhi University. She has worked uh, there as assistant professor also in Delhi University. 
and uh, she has been also working as a law officer, legal officer, maybe with some uh, bank in in maybe go in Assam or maybe Guwahati. She has uh, lots of experience uh, 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 in her own field, and I'm happy that uh, she is there with us today. She will be talking on judicial uh, undertones on boundary disputes in India. I think uh, that will be very interesting to listen to. And uh, last but uh, not the least, we have Dr. Lal Rawat Kima, who will be talking on border and its uh, discontents, uh, significations on history, land, and belongings along the National Highway 306. Dr. Lal Rawat Kima, he is uh, from sociology background, but he also has done his degree in uh, divinity. And uh, he also has uh, got his PhD degree very recently. And uh, he has been uh, working in uh, that uh, theological institute very close to Mizoram University. And he will uh, be, I think, uh, talking on a very important topic, border and its discontents from historic uh, signification on history, land, and belongings along National Highway 306. So I do welcome all of you, especially our speakers uh, who will be uh, enlightening us and giving the different perspectives of the border disputes. And uh, I know that after the end of uh, this today's uh, webinar, we will have a more holistic understanding after understanding our political, geographical, and sociological, and legal perspectives of the border issues. So friends, I will not uh, stand between uh, the participants and uh, the speakers. So I, uh, once again, welcome all of you and uh, thank uh, Dr. Lalim Pui, Lalim Pui Pachau for hosting uh, today's uh, webinar. And I do also this uh, uh, convey my thanks to the coordinator of uh, today's seminar, Dr. Lalim Pui Silo, actually history and Dr. David Laram Chulova uh, from Department of Geography. And uh, this uh, webinar is being hosted by very three very important departments, Department of History, Department of Geography, and uh, Department of Political Science. So thank you uh, once again. Welcome to all of you. And thanks uh, to this uh, the team for uh, selecting this particular topic, which uh, uh, has have troubled us very recently. And uh, some people have been, uh, have lost their lives. And uh, if we go into the history, they Uh, sorry, bear with us for a short while. I think Vice Chancellor Sir says internet is a bit erratic at the moment. Uh, I guess we'll just take on from here. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, for the welcome speech and for the introduction, brief introduction that you've given of our uh, research, resource persons. And now we will begin our first technical session with uh, Professor Dongil. I will uh, talk a little bit about him. Professor Dongil teaches at the Department of Political Science, Mizoram University, and he is currently 
a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow at the Department of Political Science, University of Cincinnati, Ohio State, USA. And his topic for tonight is Border Disputes in the Northeast India. Professor Dongil got his BA from Patkai Christian College, Nagaland, and a master's in political science with first class from Manipur University. He has been teaching political science both at undergraduate and postgraduate level since 1996. His areas of specializations are autonomous district council, sixth shed schedule to the constitution of India, local government, and Northeast studies. Professor Dongil has evaluated 23 PhD theses and eight MPhil dissertations from different universities, and he has successfully supervised uh, four PhDs and 10 MPhil dissertations. He has also authored four books, edited one book, and co-edited two books. So thank you, Professor Dongil, for uh, making time for us tonight, and over to you, sir. Yeah, please bear with us again. It looks like uh, Professor Donald has some technical problem. It won't be long. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Please uh, go ahead with the presentation. Me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. So, I'll be dealing with border dispute in North States of India, but. The topic chosen and the time allotted is not daily. So frankly speaking, I may not be able to do justice to the topic. This border dispute it is a sensitive and detailed topic. And for its appropriate clarification, minimum one hour lecture is required. But as time allotted is on about 25 minutes, I'll just touch only the main point. That's why I may not be able to do justice to the topic. I, I may not take even 20 minutes. I'll just highlight the important points. Then I should not disturb the timing of other speakers. That's what I think. So I'll start. Okay, starting with introduction. What we call Boulder? It is defined by Oxford Advanced Learner Dictionary as the line that divide countries or areas. And as we know, this concept of both political, historical, ethical, psychological, and artistic connotation. And more or less, Boulder is now appearing as interdisciplinary concept. 
and this interdisciplinary concept it covers geography, politics, sociology, cultural studies, literature, history, economics, anthropology, and so on. And border can be des de uh, described as international border, national border, state border, district border, and village border. And two other synonymous terms for borders are boundary and frontier. And as we know, even now there are international border dispute between India and China, India and Pakistan, China and the neighboring countries, then among the states in India and among the states in Northeast India. And why interstate border dispute is there? The so-called interstate border dispute in Northeast this is a colonial legacy. So it is the wrong committed from the company came so close to the bold Divani or revenue of Bengal, Bihar, and Orisha by Robert Clyde way back in 1765. Then, before British annexation, territories inhabited by tribals in eastern frontier of Bengal, they were neither part of India nor part of Assam. In fact, the so-called Assam province was creation of British colonialism for its own administrative convenience. So there was no Assam province in pre-colonial era. And in 1824 to 1826, Burmese were defeated by uh, British in first Anglo-Burmese war. Then treaty was signed in from the capital of Lower Burma, which was known as Treaty of Yandabo, which was signed on 24th February. 1826. And with the signing of this treaty of Yandabo, Lowell Brahmaputra Valley was taken over by the British. And with the signing of this treaty of Yandabo, the British acquired tribal territories in Northeast India one after another. Garo Hills was the first to be annexed in 1822 before the signing of treaty of Yandabo. And after that, Golpara was added to British created province of Assam in 1826. Then Assam in 1832, Khasi Hills in 1835, North Kassar Hills in 1854, Naga Hills in 1866, Gentia Hills in 1883. Northeast Frontier Trek was occupied since 1842. Northeast Frontier Trek means the present Arunachal Pradesh, and it was completely annexed in 1914. Lusa Hills was occupied since 1819, and it was annexed to British Empire on 6 September 1895. And these tribal territories in Northeast India, they were different from plain Hindus and Masarman. The British administrator felt that different exclusive laws and regulations were required for governing this area. So the same law and regulation which were imposed in the area may not be applicable in the hill territories. They had different concepts. The British enforced the following in eastern frontier of Bengal, such were 73, Chedu District 1876, Government of India of 1919, after British colonialism, then Assam, and when this hill territory dispute started with the parent state of Assam. I'll go briefly in different states. First, starting with Assam, it was separated into administration. 
Naga Hills under Tonsang Division in uh, Part B of the sequence, which was convened at Kohima in 1957-63. With the gradation of NHDA to State of Nagaland in 1963, border dispute between Assam and Nagaland started. So in this, frequently, there were border class between Assam and Nagaland. There was border class in 1965, 1968, and 1979. And the worst border class between Assam and Nagaland took place between 5th to 7th March 1985 in Nera in Mokha district, where Assam police lost 50 armed constables and Nagaland police lost uh, six armed constables. That was the worst border class. And after the status quo was maintained, but from time to time, there was periodic border dispute between Assam and then Assam and Meghalaya border dispute. So Garo Hills, Khasi Hills, and Zertia Hills were created into autonomous state of Meghalaya in 1970. And that autonomous state of Meghalaya was upgraded to state of Meghalaya by Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971. And with the creation of state of Meghalaya, border dispute started between Meghalaya and uh, Assam. Then uh, Meghalaya did not recognize Assam Reorganization Act 1969. And Meghalaya claimed that some territories of uh, Khasi dominated area were included inside Assam. Uh, in such a way, border class took place between Meghalaya and Assam from time to time. Then next, Assam Arunachal border issue. So Arunachal, earlier known as Northeast Frontier Trek uh, Northeast Frontier Agency NEFA, and Northeast Frontier was created into Union Territory of Arunachal Pradesh in 1972. And with the creation of Union Territory of Arunachal Pradesh, border dispute started between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. So from time to time, there was border class between Arunachal Pradesh and Assam, mainly in 1992. And after that, eviction drive was done by Assam government in 2005. Then there was border tension in 2005. Seven. Then border flare up also took place in October. In border class, even violent border class, assembly question was tabled in Assam Legislative Assembly by one MLA of Assam, Kisab Mahanta from AGP, with regard to border dispute between Assam and the neighboring country. And with regard to that, the then Minister of State Independence for Boulder Area Development, Siddiq Ahmed replied that 77,829 hectares of Assam territory are under the control of six neighboring countries, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, West Bengal, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Tripura. But on the other hand, the neighboring states claim that their ancestral land was being forcibly occupied by Assam. So that is the tension which is going on. And coming to Manipur Nagaland border dispute. So Manipur and Nagaland also has border dispute in Juko Valley. This Juko Valley was claimed both by Nagaland and Manipur. And this Juko Valley was is surrounded by hills with scenic beauty. And both the state claimed this Juko. Then in 1980, Manipur Forest Department sent some of for some of its forest staff to do survey work in this Juko Valley. But those staffs of Manipur Forest Department sent by Manipur government were arrested by Nagaland police. They were taken to Kohima. And after negotiation between the two state government, those staffs of Manipur Forest Department, they were released. But even now, tension is still going on between Manipur and Assam with regard to this uh, Juko Valley. And now coming to the last part, Assam Mizoram Boulder dispute. So what is the status of this Assam Mizoram Boulder dispute? And this Assam Mizoram dispute mainly concentrated 
in 509 square miles. This is the this is the main bone of contention in the Boulder dispute. Then what was the status of these 509 square miles in pre-colonial era? In pre-colonial era, these 509 square miles in the foothill, it was the ancestral land of the Zhou ethnic group. Those Zhou ethnic group, the Chin Kuki Mizo ethnic group, their chiefs and the people dominated this area in pre-colonial era. And there were powerful Mizo chiefs like Mong Silo who ruled this area. Then another chief was Zelenga. Then another, uh, so when British also established the estate, tea garden in the area, they call it, they call it after the name of that Mizou chief, Zelenga T Aste. Then there was also another Mizou chief, Paloya. And when this tea estate was established, it was also known as Paloya T Estate. Then there were also another chiefs from Zhou ethnic group like uh, Halam Lal Chonga, then some Tadu Kuki chiefs, then some chiefs from the old Kuki group. They were here. And mention of these chiefs ruling over this area was mentioned by prominent historian from Qatar, Suhas Chatterji, in his book, Mizou Chiefs and the Chief, and uh, in other books also. That's why in pre colonial this area was the administered land and traditional land of the Zhou ethnic group. Then what was the status during colonial era? So as we, Lusai Hills was annexed after Qin Lusai expedition of 1889-1890. But even before Lusai Hills was annexed to the British Empire, in the line was already in force in this Lusai frontier, this frontal area of Lusai Hills. And due to that, this territory of Lusai Hills was encroached by the British from time to time. Then, in 1871, Superintendent of Qatar, Edgar, was said to have signed treaty with Sokwilala, prominent silo chief. But it was found to be imposter of Sokwilala. And due to that, Alexandra Pool Tea Garden and different tea garden were raided and attacked in December 1871. Due to that, James Winchester was killed and his daughter Mary Winchester was kidnapped. And the impact of that was Lusai expedition of 1871-1872, where Lusai Hills was attacked by British forces from two different directions, from Chittagong and Qatar. And after their subduing the chiefs of Lusai Hills, then uh, British lived and rescued Mary Winchester and leave it. But raid continued on. And as raid continued on from both Chin Hills and Lusai Hills, British conducted another expedition in 1889-90. And one thing that I would like to mention was that because of frequent raids of chiefs of Lusa Hills in Chittagong Hill Tracks, in 1888, British revenue collection in Chittagong Hill Track declined from 89,109 to 83,222. As we know, the main purpose of the British coming to India was for commercial gain and resource, economic resources. So it was a serious threat from British Empire. And due to that, Chin Hills and Lusai Hills were attacked by the British forces from all different directions. South Lusai Hills and uh, Qatar and Chittagong in Lusai Hills, then South Chin Hills and North Chin Hills. Then after that, both Chin Hills and Lusa Hills were put under British administration. And Lusa Hills was occupied since 1890, but it was completely annexed to British Empire on 6 September 1895. So, and with regard to this, in 1875, South, one boundary line was demarcated. One in, uh, notification was issued issued by British colonial ruler in 1875, which was regarded as the in the line of South Lusai Hills. And that 1875 notification was issued as part of the agreement between uh, Sok Wilala, the prominent Mizou chief, 
and British administration. Due to that, 1875 is still regarded as the uh, relevant and bona fide boundary between Qatar and Sahil still today. And it is the standpoint of government of Mizoram. It is the standpoint of civil societies of Mizoram. And that's why this 1875 notification is still the standpoint of government of Mizoram. And after that, without concerning the Mizoram chief, notification was issued by the British in 1933, which was not accepted by the people of Mizoram and the government of Mizoram. So with regard to that, I would like to clarify that. Then what was the boundary dispute after independence? After independence, Lusa Hills was accommodated and it was inserted in the constitution of India with Autonomous District Council. And under the provision of Sikh schedule, Autonomous District was not entitled to look after reserve forest. And as this 509 square miles disputed area, the present disputed area was already declared as reserve forest by the British. Mizo District Council was not entitled to look after it. Because of that, it was looked after by the Forest Department of Government of Mizoram. And due to that, uh, Mizo District Council was not entitled to look after forest, reserve forest area. But revenue, which was collected from this reserve forest area, 70% of the revenue was given to Mizo District Council by Asa, uh, uh, Kassel Forest Division. And 30% was taken by Castle Forest Division as administrative post. And with regard to this, R.V. Subramaniam, Secretary Tribal Development Government of Assam, issued a notification in 1953, 9 April 1953. And by that, uh, it was clearly mentioned. So if revenue from that area was given to Mizo District Council, constitutionally, the government of Assam also recognized that area as from Lusa Hills. Until now, this reserve forest is the bone of contention. And even during Mizo District Council era, Mizo District Council leaders often raised to Assam government to solve this boundary issue, but it was not taken up properly. And with the upgradation of Lusa Hills to Union Territory of Mizoram in 1972, the matter became uh, so sensitive, then border dispute started. And with regard to that, Mizo cultivators in the area, sometimes they were humiliated, uh, sometimes they were arrested, mainly in 1973, then after that in 1974. And in this, the first chief minister of Mizoram, George Funga, even write to the prime minister of India and home minister of India, and he wrote to the Assam chief minister also. Then from time to time, boulder dispute flare up. And even after Mizoram became statehood, the boulder dispute continue on. From time to time, boulder dispute drop up in 1987, 1994. Then in 2008, the son of the first chief minister of Mizoram, Sultan Zama, who worked in his paddy field at Zophai, was arrested by Assam police. Then MZP took up this issue from time to time. And in 2018, when Zhou Fatech that means race out of the Zhou ethnic group, was constructed by MZP at Zhou Fai. It was on 19 March 2018, Assam police fired those peaceful students who work on the spot. And many students were injured. And even lady journalist, MBC lobby was injured uh, in the incidents. But no appropriate action was taken by Congress government of Mizoram at that time. Then how the recent boulder flare took place on 9 October 2020 last year, Assam police and forest department, they burned down the heart of Zon Loma and Chingdun village. And that was the starting of the present border dispute. And after that, there was outbreak of violence between Bairangti and Lailapur on 17 October 2020. Then it was followed by blockade of National Highway. But after about seven months of near normalcy, border issue became sensitive again 
from June 2021 this year. Then from time to time, there was tension in the Boulder area, and which was followed by encroachment around Hundred twenty Assam police personnel at the Ailong village and policy then as the Mizoram government. But then in two thousand twenty one, Union Home Minister Amit Shah this issue was there. But two days after that meeting, that was on twenty six July two thousand twenty one, IGP of Assam, DCSP and DFO of Kachar with around two hundred armed constable. They moved towards Mizoram boundary, then ran over uh, Mizoram police outpost, which was made only by 10 persons, and they went as far as Bairangte auto stand. And in such a way, Mizoram police retaliated, and unwanted incident took place, which led to the loss of six lives on the spot. So this was very unfortunate. This is how the Boulder issue flare up. And at present, as we know, there is Boulder dispute between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, Assam and Meghalaya, Assam and Nagaland, Assam and Mizoram, then Nagaland and Manipur. So most of these border disputes are due to colonial legacy. Because of not solving the problem on the basis of historical fact, culture and tradition. Due to that, it is inherited from colonial time and it is not properly taken up by government of India and the problem still exists. That's why for solving this border issue, broad political negotiation is required. And for solving this next political problem, historical facts, historical roots should be taken into account and culture and life other factors should be taken into account. And this border dispute cannot be solved by court, Supreme Court or High Court. It can only be solved through negotiation on the basis of historical faith, on the basis of culture, on the basis of ethnicity, and on the basis of the fact that which tribe, which people, and which ethnic group occupied that area, starting from pre-colonial. In such a way, only through negotiation, this vex border issue among the states of Northeast could be solved. Okay, with this, let me conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Donia. Hello. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Donia, for your enlightened and informative lecture. And I hope all the participants have new insights into the uh, ongoing border disputes. And uh, if you have any question on the topic uh, cover by, covered by Dr. Uh, Professor Donia, please send in your questions, both in uh, Mizo and English in the comment section, and th they will be addressed in the discussion hour after the presentations. And also please do remember to mention, uh, as we have more uh, resource, resource persons coming, Please do remember to mention to whom your questions are addressed. And also I would like to take, uh, I would like to take this time to encourage all the participants to fill up the feedback form, which will be available in the comments section later on uh, towards the end of the uh, session. Please do fill that in so that we can generate your e-certificate. Now we will move on to the uh, next uh, presenter. Our next presenter is Dr. K. C. Lamelsom Zava. He teaches uh, geography at the Department of Geography and Resource Management, Mizoram University. Dr. K. C. Lama Somzava completed his training in geography from Nehu Shillong with first class degrees in both uh, BA and MA, and he got his PhD in 2012. He has been teaching in Mizoram University since 2011. Uh, he was the founder pres uh, president of Nehu Geographical Research Forum, Shillong, while he was doing PhD. And uh, Dr. Lelma Somzava has published eight books, 
20 research papers and 10 articles in the form of book chapters. He has presented a good number of He has presented a good number of research papers at uh, national and international uh, level and visited Africa, Europe, and America for academic purposes. In the field of research, he is actively working with the Food and Agriculture Organization under the UN, the Mizoram State Rural Livelihoods Mission, and Indian Council of Social Science Research. He is currently the president of Geography, Geography Association of Mizoram. Uh, now may I invite Professor K. C. Lalmal Somzava to present his paper titled A Geographical Perspective on Border Disputes with Special Reference to Mizoram Assam Border. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mimi. And thank you all. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Okay, thank you so much for your introductions and uh, many thanks to the organizing team. So, Professor Dogel already, you know, finish up what you know, is going on and what happened about the border. So I'll just talk about uh, the geographical perspective and let me just share my slide and then I can, is it visible, Miss? Yes, it's visible. Okay, okay. Uh, since he already cover up, my perspective is you know, slightly different and it may be also a little bit far from reality because it is a theoretical paper. So as you can see here in my slide that uh, it is going to be a geographical perspective. So let me just highlight the point of conflicts that uh, we see uh, recently. So uh, even uh, Professor Dongel already mentioned that so far there is a claims and claims from both sides. So, you know, we have our own stunt some government has or has their own stance and Muslim government has their own stance. So, and the region are also, you know, they have their own claims. So which I'm not going to repeat because Professor Dongel already highlighted nicely. So the main intention of this paper is to have a general overview of the border dispute from the eyes of the political geographers and try to correlate, uh, correlate and fit in its relevance to understand and chalk out some kind of strategy or mitigations to, uh, to solve the problems. So I have three broad, you know, uh, you know points that I'd like to discuss with you tonight. The first one is relevance of organic state theory of transits uh, on a some and other not distant state for the disputes. So I think this may be new for many of you. And then the second point that I'd like to share with you is about relevance of Cox and Reynolds approach to mitigate border disputes. And the third one that I just want to share uh, my opinion on satellite technology that has been suggested by the some government to solve these border disputes. So based on these three main topics, uh, I just want to share uh, my thoughts. So Frederick Dutzel actually was a German, you know, scholars, and he was a he was a uh, founder of uh, political geography. Okay, he's compare states and living organisms. According to him, a uh, state is like an uh, living organism. It should grow or it should die. It cannot stand still because living things are moved, right? So that is the logic here. So he clearly mentioned that states are involved in an endless struggle for space. So all the organisms are in a fight for space. And the space here means area, okay? And the most powerful will have the largest spaces. So this is the point. The largest spaces will go to the brave one, okay? So actually he was, you know, deeply influenced by Darwin, the interior of origin of spaces then carry forward by Harvard Spencer, who phrased the word survival of the fittest. So according to Spencer, strong against the weak as a law of nature, both among society and among animals. So these scholars, this school of thought, you know, uh, find that society, animals, and, you know, 
they are fighting for the existence. In which survival of the fittest is the Mankawit. And it is very natural, according to them. It is very natural. So it is known as social Darwinism. So again, Radzel said that uh, high density of populations have a more valid claims to empty land than those with a low density. So therefore, to become politically powerful, people should multiply themselves as rapidly as possible and take over empty lands. That is the logic behind this theory. So <clears throat> if you look the, uh, you know, try to relate with the present situation with uh, uh, Assam and other Northeastern states, uh, you can see here, if you look the density per square kilometer, so Assam and Tripura have comparatively, you know, high density of populations. So that means they behave, you know, differently compared to other states because they have to accommodate the increasing populations. So from this angle, it seems like Rajal's theory seems very valid. So extent territory, that's it. If one's need increases, like a baby growing up, her demand also increase. It is necessary to extend your room. They call it Leban Sharam. This is a living space in German, you know. If your family member increased, then you are supposed to extend your house, even at the cost of others, even at the cost of others. So that is natural law. So today we claimed that we are civilized and expect the central government to intervene and to solve our problems. But in reality, Fighting for space is the law of nature. And survival of the fittest is the mantra of it. All political boundaries are mammoth, and at the end of the day, there is no law in the borders, no law at all. So, and Radzel once again mentioned the importance of occupations. According to him, state has two complementary aspects. The first one is organic, which is the land. And the, the spiritual, which is the society and the society's sentimental to the land. So state is an organic entity, which in the course of history become increasingly attached to the land and the soil in which it exists. So like an individual who loves his birthplace, when he grow old and old, you know, when he grow older and older, then he start looking back where he start his life. So ultimately the land, that means the organic and the people spiritual are inspirables. So that's why who can think of Mizoram without Mizo, Assam without Assamis. Similarly, if one occupy empty space earlier than the other inhabitants, then with time passes that land belongs to him. So Professor Dongel already mentioned that who are the inhabitants before pre-colonials and then after the pre-colonial. That need to be you know, taken care of. And that is what Rajan also mentioned in his theory of uh, or organic theory. And then another point here is the importance of transport network. According to Rajan's, the transport uh, 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 is you know transformed from the natural to cultural. So if you look the border between Assam and other northeastern state, one can witness the importance of transport networks and its developmental role as well as how it changed the landscape, which further complicated, you know, the demarcating boundaries. So we claims like the tea gardens, you know some portion in Assam and some portion in Mizoram. But because of this transported work and other developmental activities, it is very, very difficult to identify the exact 
seven occasions now because of transformation of the rain due to transport network. And another interesting aspect that uh, Radzel said, uh, you know, was that uh, the, or the size of the stem growth releases expansions. These three, you know, elements are inspirable. We say they go hand in hand. So this is also very, very important and very valid. So with increasing population, each generation would feel more keenly a scarcity of land and resource to support themselves that would lead to conflict and annexation. So way back in 1930s or before that also, he actually, you know, uh, talk about this, the problem that is going to be happened among states, among countries, because he predicted that increasing population will automatically and finally lead to, you know, conflicts. So from this organic state theory, border dispute are a must and natural, a must and natural one. It is plainly a natural phenomena. The stronger will eat up the weaker. That is a law of nature. So therefore to survive, one need to prepare, work for it in all aspects. Because if you look back human history, especially before World War I and World War II, before that, there is no justice in, in, in the world, no justice. The word justice and peace start prevailing only when we set up the League of Nations and the uh, UNO after World War II. Only after that, there is there's justice and peace, you know, that, 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 that them has been met by, you know, congregations of, you know, uh, nations to make it prevail of peace and justice. Before that, we each other, there's a war and that just happened. But in a global scale, we witnessed justice only after 19, you know, 45. Uh, I mean, first world war is second world war, let's say. So this organic theory influenced Nazi German and Hitler's expansionist strategy, strategy during World War I and two. Because Radal Hess, that is Hitler's secretary, who would assist in the writing of Main Kane, was a student of Karl Hauschaffer, father of geopolitics. And Karl Hauschaffer was influenced by Radal. So well, his history has and Hitler were imprisoned after the Munich in 1923. Hausdorffer spent six hours visiting the two, bringing along a copy of Frederick Russell's political geography. And also some people believe that Nazi ideology has a deep impact on RSI's uh, ideology. So in fact, this, the sign, uh, Nazi sign, you know, symbol, swastika, is an Indian origin. So anyway, if you want to know more about it, you can ask Google. Now, let me go to the second point. This will take only two, three minutes. Uh, relevance of Cox and Reynolds approach to mitigate the problems. So we already talked about war fighting for space is natural from the organic uh, their theory. Now let's try to have some uh, remedies. So Koch and Reynolds, when they redefine political geography, so the philosophy behind this new paradigm shift was that who get what, where, and how. So we have to identify who get what, where, and how. So primarily the aim of this new definition of political geography uh, is to make use of the subject as a conflict resolving mechanisms based on locational context. Because geography is a locational science. So conflict resolving mechanisms. So to do that, this who, what, where, and how is the key. Now let's me explain briefly who means the people or the population of the area under review. Their race, case, plan, or other relevant characteristics. So now what we have to do is like who are in the borders? Is it the original Assamese? or the original Mizou people? 
or immigrants. So we have to understand who they are, not only in the border, even the whole state. So this is not only applicable to solve the border dispute, even among the regional disparity, regional problems, the North and the South, Chimbiel, Chantu, and this site, you know, if you want to relate it. Anyway, what drives us to the various goods and bats enjoy relationship and infrastructures? This is another point. So if you look at this angle with this point, what kind of facility they are enjoying, they are poor or rich. So that identification and proper understanding will really help to solve the problems because you are going to know the conditions, their conditions and their problems. Queer means variations, living standard, regional variation, let me say. So, the standard all refers to So that means how you implemented development activities or how government schemes has been introduced in the particular areas. So that is also important to solve because after you identify based on these four you know, questions, then you can somehow suggest the problem and to, to solve the problems and to mitigate at least, if you may not be able to solve completely, at least to mitigate the problems. So these are the solutions. So therefore, since geography is time and space, it is important to understand the history of this particular region, its geographical terrains and how it linked with the people and their culture to the, to the market boundary. These are Highlanders. If, even if you ask people to stay down there in the low-lying areas, they may not. Because if you look the hinterlands, I mean, the outskirts, the border lines of Mizoram throughout, Mm -hmm. You understand that there are very you know, sparse populations because it, the, it is the low-lying area. So don't stay there. So Assamis are usually in the updates. So this much understanding is also must be very helpful to solve the problems. So how the location, the area were names, for example, like Aitlang, is it? So or Assamis? or the Assamis have their own language, or they, 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 they name it these particular peaks, Hoi Hills. So therefore, in order to make any settlement or redemarcations of the boundary, one need to know the geographical contents of it. Now, in one slide, uh, satellite technology. Let me just share my opinion here, because this uh, satellite technology will be used, this is proposed by the Assam government, yes. It is very, very important tools. But we should remember that it is a tool only. It is man-made. Men use these tools for their own purpose. So what we need to do first is have a ground verification. Settle men on the actual grounds. And only after that, we can make any agreeable boundaries. Before that, this technology does not make any sense. So latitude and longitude can be drawn only after for per settlement on the grounds. Otherwise, there is a possibility of cartographic invasions, which happened and did by China in Arunachal Pradesh and Ladakh. This can happen. So once groundwork is done, then it is very useful, like what we know in the 38 parallel, the uh, North parallel in uh, the dividing North Korea and South Korea. Even in the United States, they are using this latitude and longitude to demarcate the boundaries, even among the states, you know. So these are very useful tools. Zorich is very useful tools. But as I say, the present line of boundaries is not accepted. So what we need to understand here is that if, as, as it is, for example, like Saikutir and Juvel, who is within very much uh, of Mizoram because the yellow line is the boundary. So the some government will not accept this one. And if you look at this one, the yellow line is uh, the, the, the Google boundaries, let's say the satellite boundary. Sai it is outside Mizoram. 
So Mizoram government may not accept this one. So in both sides, here Assam government will not accept the existing you know, satellite boundary, local boundary. Here Mizoram may not accept satellite boundary. So that's why ground verification is a must. Without that, we cannot solve the problems. So conclusion, ultimately what we need to do is to work on for peaceful solution on the border dispute as already suggested by the previous speaker. So let's develop the area, facilitate people living in the border and to transform the zone of conflict into the zone of peace and interactions. Because we are going to be neighbor forever. We have no choice now. Failing to see anything good on the other side makes us a dialogue impossible. Without a dialogue, the same worst thing will repeat. So that is how I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. K. Sira Malsonzava for your presentation, sharing with us interesting perspective on which, uh, by which we can understand the assam Mizoram border in particular, and also using the theory of space and drawing parallels with other parts of the world. And we also appreciate uh, your views on how the border problems could be mitigated and how we can use technology as well. And I would here, at this point, I would like to encourage uh, all the participants uh, to, uh, uh, to write your questions in the comment section. Those will be addressed uh, at the end of the session. And uh, now, so now we will move on to our third speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Mer uh, Ms. Mercy K. Kaute. Uh, Ms. Mercy K. Kaute is trained in history and law from uh, Loreto, uh, Loreto College, Kolkata, and Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. She has also completed a course on women's health and international human rights from the University of Stanford. Prior to joining academics, uh, Ms. Kaute had worked as law officer with Allahabad Bank, and she began her career in teaching at the University of, uh, at the West Bengal National University of Judicial Sciences, sorry, Kolkata. And she currently teaches public laws, both uh, civil and criminal at undergraduate and postgraduate levels at the Faculty of Law in uh, University of Delhi. She is the Associate Managing Editor of the International Journal of Legal Studies and Research and a member of the Scientific Reviewer at the Global Academic Research Institute, multidisciplinary conferences uh, that has its headquarters in Sri Lanka. And she is on the advisory board of various students' welfare-related platforms and publishing houses. Uh, like E-Justice India and Notice Cell, uh, Delhi University. Ms. Kaute's area of interests are legal pl pluralism in the context of customary law in the gendered perspectives, medical laws and women's right to healthcare services and mental health. So may I invite uh, Ms. Mercy H. Kaute. Uh, am I audible and am I visible as well? Yes, you are. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay. Uh, very good evening and uh, thank you, Dr. Pachau. That was a very kind introduction and I really am very overwhelmed to be here, uh, to say the least, uh, with such a distinguished panel of speakers that you have. So I was just thinking to myself that I should have just not signed up for this because, you know, I was just... Uh, immersing myself in all the information that you know the two panelists before me had said and I and I'm afraid there's not much that is left for me to say but let me just try to navigate my way out of this now that I've signed up for this uh, event so uh, like uh, already said by uh, uh, in the introductory speech by professor uh, by Dr. Pachau that my interest is in women's studies so what I intend to do is perhaps try to navigate a kind of, you know, a little uh, sway away from the, uh, the, you know, perhaps the line of discussion when we talk about border disputes, because I want to look at it from a gendered perspective as well, the impact of border dispute. Because for some uh, reason, you know, uh, what I, I think I should also say this is that being from the legal background and also for someone who is not currently serving in the state, I think my opinion could be that of an outsider, you know, and when I, and when I, when I say that, 
I don't mean to disrespect or disregard anyone, but sometimes it's easier to, you know, be standing out of the circle and, you know, observing what is going on uh, in, you know, in a certain area. So when I look at it from the, from my perspective of, you know, border disputes, especially in the Northeast, sometimes the question that comes to my mind is that, is it because we undermine the impact of border disputes? Is that because we fail to understand that you know these border disputes, which arises out of interstate border disputes, if not resolved, is very soon, you know, going to result into intrastate disputes, because the repercussions that we suffer, you know, when these when these disputes are not resolved, comes heavily on women and children, and uh, which also you know whereby the uh, incidences of crimes also go high. So the question then lies that, you know, when these kind of problems start plaguing our society, where do we look for solutions, right? Can we expect the central government to come to our rescue every time we face any kind of domestic issues that could perhaps arise out of threatened uh, economy, uh, you know, that the state is undergoing, or, you know, the fear of losing out our employment because of the influx of, you know, uh, migrants from other states or from our, you know, because we are anyways, uh, kind of bestowed with a very porous international boundary. So for me, what I want to look at, so for me, what I intend to do is I want to look at the border disputes uh, from a very, you know, from a gendered perspective. And at the same time, also maybe try to navigate my discussion through, you know, the constitutional framework that we have. So on that note, I will just share my screen with you. And I just have two slides uh, that I want to, you know, uh, share with all of you. And these are very, very simple slides, which I believe a lot of you would have already uh, have an idea about. Uh, now, you know, uh, and I suppose we, we are students, you know, of the uh, social sciences background. So it wouldn't be too difficult for us to, you know, connect to what I'm trying to put across is that when we look at the constitution, because in law, I, and, uh, you know, I don't have a choice then to follow the constitutional principles. And we know that the constitutions all, you know, uh, attempts to uphold the federalistic uh, state of affairs that we have been, you know, uh, given upon ourselves, taking it upon ourselves. And when I say that, we also need to understand that we are, India is a union of states and union territories, whereby, you know, we have an indestructible union and destructible states which means that the union cannot be destroyed, but the states can be, you know, uh, split in, you know, uh, split and new states can be formed, which has always happened. So why is it so difficult that the Northeast boundary issues have not been resolved till date, you know? And the reason why, if you look at this slide here, the first slide, if you see, it talks about Article 131. This is from the Indian Constitution of Article 131. And I just felt it, you know, apt for me to share these uh, two slides that I have for the simple fact that I do get queries as to why is the judiciary, the Supreme Court, the Apex Court of India not interfering whenever there is an interstate dispute. Professor Dongil was, uh, in all his kindness was, you know, had touched upon uh, in a sentence that the high courts and the Supreme Court cannot intervene. And, you know, the question and the answer to this question lies in the fact that in Article 131, if you look at it, it clearly says that, you know, it is an original jurisdiction. So whenever there is a dispute between states, the Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction. But in 1956, there was an amendment that was added. And this is, uh, I don't know if I should call it a trick or, but this is how we are taught in law schools that we ought to read between the lines you know, and many times when we read the constitution as a political science student or a history student or a student from social sciences or even from pure science, we tend to read laws, we tend to read the legislative text, you know, just as what it appears to us. But the answer to the questions as to why can't the judicial courts intervene when there is an interstate boundary dispute is because of the proviso that is, you know, given in article 131, which clearly says that if the boundary issue has been, uh, you know, demarcated based on some kind of a, you know, if it's been reduced into writing through an agreement or through an instrument in writing, then, you know, the jurisdiction of the court is ruled out. So the, to put an end to the question as to why can't the judicial courts intervene when there is an interstate dispute in India, this is the answer here, Article 131, the proviso clause. But we know that India is having dispute issues with, you know, China, 
and the state and you know it is Indian the central government that is intervening is because again it's an international boundary issue. So now the question that again another very common question that I am often asked with and we do discuss among friends is that so why is it that we're not able to you know resolve the boundary disputes? And uh, it, it's also interesting to note, I think uh, uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir here, Professor Vedera had also very, uh, you know, clearly pointed out that the issues in, you know, Punjab or in Haryana, or let's say issues between Maharashtra and Karnataka at one point in time over Belagam district, or even in the state of Andhra Pradesh, it's very distinct from that of Northeast because these states were carved out post independence on the basis of linguist, you know, language. Language has been a very, very important factor. And, and most of the disputes that you see in the rest of India arises out of because of you know, language issues or because of the distribution of natural resources or waterways. You know? But when we talk about the Northeast, it's not on the, this demarcation or the bifurcation of Assam into the state of Mizoram or Arunachal or Meghalaya or Nagaland. This was never done on the basis of uh, language, nor was it ever done on the basis of religion nor on culture. But this was basically more about, you know, this was more or less like already discussed, superimposed to us by the colonial regime, because, you know, for them, it was about administrative, uh, you know, con uh, convenience that they sought. And today, till today, we are not able to solve these boundary issues through negotiations, through alternate dispute resolutions, through mediations. You know, the issue with the uh, Assam has been having issues with Nagaland. It has been having issues with Arunachal, with Meghalaya, even with Mizoram. That means that the crux of the problem is there. We know that the problem is there. So now we need to find solutions because I believe that, you know, a, hist a very detailed historical issue and, you know, how the political arena, how the issue came into the political arena had already been discussed by our first resource person. And very interestingly, I was listening to the theories that were also discussed by the second resource person, Professor uh, Zava, and that was very uh, comprehensive. So for me, uh, what I, you know, but the questions that still come to my mind is that, we have been trying for the last almost four decades now to solve, to resolve these boundary disputes. And we still have not been able to do that through negotiation, nor have we been able to do that through dialogues. So is there no other alternatives that we have, you know, whereby we can find solutions to this? Is there no other uh, method of, uh, you know, conciliation? Is there no other legal solutions that, you know, the constitution or the law of the land provides us? And I'm tempted to tell you that we do have another, uh, you know, uh, uh, an another recourse that is uh, available for us, you know, and that is through the interstate, uh, you know, through the interstate uh, uh, councils. And uh, we, we also know that, you know, this is provided in the constitution and the article 262. So we do have a constitution that has given us adequate amount of, you know, solutions that, you know, we can always uh, talk about that we can always discuss. You know, so we have the interstate uh, councils. So my question is that, why is it that we never tried or have we ever tried, uh, you know, uh, looking at solutions? Is there any problem? Uh, somebody has a question? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so if you look at Article 263, you know, we do have, like I said, we do have a constitutional framework. There is a constitutional provision that provides for the establishment of interstate council. And if you look at the interstate council, even if you log in for those of you who are interested to know more in details, you can just go on into the, you know, website and you will clearly see that some of the objectives that has been enumerated in the constitution itself is to inquire and advise disputes that may arise between states. So when we talk about disputes, are we going to give it a narrow interpretation and say that, oh, these disputes could be in relation to waterways or disputes could be only in relation to natural resources? The constitution doesn't define what disputes are. It simply says that if there is any kind of dispute that arises between states, it can fall within the domain of the interstate council to adjudicate and, you know, sorry, to discuss about it and to advise the government's concern. So have we ever tried uh, you know, resolving our disputes. Have we ever made an appeal to the Interstate Council? Because the last time, if I'm not mistaken, the Interstate Council met in the year 1996. So at this point, we also need to question our, uh, you know, uh, government of the day as to why is it that when there is already a body that is set up to advise, which is advisory in nature, 
to you know advise these states with uh, you know coming up with amicable solutions why is it that we never recount exploring these kind of uh, you know uh, provisions that are already available you know that's a question that has been there in my mind ever since i was invited for this uh, session and i don't know if there is a solution or i don't know if there is a response to it so perhaps we will try to find that out and also if not the interstate council we do also have the provisions and we also have established the zonal councils and we do have zonal councils even for eastern india right and i think we quite fairly and squarely fall in these kind of disputes that we have don't you think it fairly square falls within the understanding or the ambit of the word dispute so you know if we say that these disputes are political issues because we know that these uh, have arisen because of the historical legacy that was left behind history is history you know it's very very important because it builds the foundation for today and if i say that these are political issues uh, given the kind of government that we have the multi party system government or uh, political system that we have in india the democratic setup governments have changed you know the governance may not have varied too much but governments have changed in both you know for in for instance we take uh, the recent incident of uh, mizoram in assam the government of the day had changed you know but why is it that no government today no political party till today has been able to solve these issues if you only talk about and argue it from the on the lines of vote banks is it not a very very important issue that could either make it that you know that could perhaps help you to make it or break it in the next elections so i i don't know for me i just believe that the answer lies the solution lies within ourselves and sometimes it's so important to also be uh you know to also speak up and to make if we feel that you know perhaps the central government or perhaps the government at the larger level is not taking interest it's important that we recon and it's also important that we uh secure our place and make our voices being heard over all these issues so uh all the i i will not be dwelling into the political gamut of all how these solutions are to be met because we all know that there has been adequate amount of dialogues that has been adequate amount of negotiations that have gone around which has never really seen the light of day which has never really come out with any kind of solution so what i would just want to press through now is that perhaps maybe it's time that we look out of the box think out of the box and start looking for solutions because like i mentioned earlier interstate disputes can very soon lead to intrastate disputes and which uh, will certainly lead to a state of uh, you know it into a state of lawlessness which is are uh, going to be not just taking us back into you know barbaric uh, state because we've already reached this level of civilization and and at this point i just want to bring in the second part of my uh discussion where i want to look at this boundary disputes from a gender perspective because like i said whenever we look at you know boundary issues we also need to understand how important the repercussions of these boundary issues are especially when it comes to women and when it comes to children right because we also need to look at it we cannot it would be very very fearful if we fail to understand that human rights violation take place at enormous scale whenever there is a boundary dispute wherever there is a boundary dispute right because there it becomes a very easy breeding ground for trafficking it becomes very very easy ground for uh, you know justify uh, you know uh, for the state perhaps state agencies various agencies of states to kind of um put a veil behind all the occurrences of crimes you know and atrocities that are meted out to women so we need to also understand that you know there is a federalism you know federalistic spirit that we need to work within uh you know uh, through which we need to find amicable solutions and here in i just want to quickly uh, sum up saying that you know the role of civil society i think is very very important we know that in states like mizoram nagaland or even manipur the church plays a very very important role right and perhaps we can use these platforms not not to propagate any kind of a peculiar idea but to rather raise an awareness you know like we have the uh, you know the student union the philanthropic organizations that we have and what i see as you know as an outsider someone who has been brought up outside of the north east and you know is currently serving there what i see is that we need to kind of make ourselves more aware legally of our rights of our uh, most importantly the constitution because the constitution of india also applies to us many times you know the uh, many times the discussions that i have been a part of what i see is that oh we are protected under the fifth schedule the sixth schedule it's all right 
to have arguments on those ends. But it's also very, very important to understand the body of the text, you know, because that will give us a ground for good arguments. And I, like I said, you know, it's it's so important for like because we are addressing us, you know, student crowd. So I think we students we have a very very important role to play, because it's for us to understand how we want our futures to be shaped. Many of us are get, going to get into academics. Some of us will get into uh, perhaps uh, you know become politicians in the future, or you know get into bureaucracy and different fields of uh, you know walks of life that we're going to get into. So it is now the ball is in our court to understand because you know often we blame our politicians or you know the administration, and then we say that oh nobody wants to have any kind of solutions. Nobody really want to settle these boundary disputes. So my question is, what can we do? You know, as a student community, as the community of educated persons, what is that that we can do? And at this point, I want to encourage each of us that, you know, we, we have a voice and if we are, we have the knowledge, we need to equip ourselves so that we can evolve. And if we feel that, you know, politicians are not putting across our ideas or they're not voicing our opinion, at the end of the day, we have the power to elect, we have the power to vote, we have the power of voice. and. Um, I think uh, persons who are already working would agree with me that, you know, when you are in a job, it, our freedom of right, uh, our freedom to speech and expression becomes quite limited because we really need to watch what we say. But as student community, talking from the legal point of view, I just want to say that, you know, you have a voice that you can uh, use undaunted by the limitations that may be imposed on you once you become an employee. So I want all of us to, you know, think about it, go through the numerous, you know, go through the documents that we always talk about whenever we talk about boundary disputes, we say that, you know, okay, 1875, there was a document, 1966, there was another document, 1986, there was another document which gave us independence. So do we know the contents of these documents? I want to encourage each of you to try to get a hold of this, study it, you know, so that we can come up with solutions that, uh, you know, so that we can offer solutions and not just expect solutions to be found. And so the, if I, and I would just want to quickly sum up, you know, and say that we have constitutional provisions which are there, which perhaps have not been explored by the past generations. And the purpose for me putting up these two slides was not to kind of lecture, 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 because that is something that um, nobody wants to really be a part of, but just to kind of ignite a thought process, you know, where we could actually, you know, encourage one another to explore the uh, provisions that has been provided to us by the framers of our constitution, perhaps by the uh, by the by the law of you know that is in force, right? So on that on this note, I would want to conclude saying that these boundary issues need to be really really resolved, and uh, perhaps if we understand the repercussions that they have, maybe then we will be able to uh, put our you know thinking caps. Uh, um, you know, on a more serious note and perhaps uh, consultations of uh, the stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, it is students and it is the youth. Uh, because, you know, if these problems are not resolved, which has been continuing, the fear is that it would continue. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's only very dangerous to think about what the repercussions could be. So I encourage all of you to be more participative and perhaps, you know, as civil society, members of civil society, there's a lot more that we can do because putting theories into practice, it's, it's difficult because like the Y says that, you know, there is many slip between the lip and the cup. And so on that note, I would just want to wind up and I want to thank all the organizers for having me here. And I hope my session, there was something that would have made all of us to at least think and ponder about the uh, importance to resolve boundary disputes through the framework of the constitution. Thank you so much. Yeah, over to you, um, Professor Pachong, Dr. Pachong, you can take over, please. Um, you are muted. Okay. Thank you very much, sorry, uh, Ms. Kaute, for asking interesting questions about how uh, we try to resolve the ongoing border dispute between the Sam and Mizoram and how far and how little can the Indian judiciary intervene and also the consequences of boundary conflict and people, especially uh, among the marginalized section of the society. Thank you so much for that. And now we uh, 
we will come to our last, but definitely not the least, uh, the last presenter of this session is Dr. Laruat Kima. And Dr. Laruat Kima is trained in sociology from Delhi University, and he did theology from uh, Union Bible Seminary, Pune, United Theological College, Bangalore, and a PhD in theology from Claremont Graduate University, California, USA. And he is currently working as an assistant professor at the Academy of Integrated Christian Studies, Tanshil Aizol. And he is also the Dean of Research and Development Department. He is in charge of organizing orientations and seminars for MTH students and faculty students seminar lecture series. And he has also taken new initiative for faculty research and publications. He has worked as an assistant to the director at Institute of for Signifying Scriptures, Claremont Graduate University, and also as a research assistant in the same institute. And Dr. Laruat Kima has 16 publications in the form of articles in renowned journals and also numerous uh, edited uh, chapters in edited books. And he has uh, done uh, more than 20 presentations in conferences, both national and international, and also richly contributed in uh, editing works as well. And he, I, uh, he has also uh, done a whole lot of research on uh, borderland uh, issues and conflicts uh, within the Northeast and beyond. So on that note, may I invite Dr. Larwat Kima. Thank you, Mimi, uh, Dr. Patro, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> and um, for the invitation to be part of this uh, uh, okay. seminar, or this webinar. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, three people have spoken ab about me, and I'll be covering the same as the closing batsman for this uh, session. I'll be covering uh, similar terrain that has been covered so far. I hope it's not repetitive. It will be um, approached differently. So I just want to start off with uh, this uh, or Mizoram was designed. It was designed in a vague world. Okay. It was this is why since 1983 we the border clashes started with Assam and with our neighboring states. These are huge legacy, Supreme Court litigation, why this under committee. So these are huge legacy, very, very complex problems. And we just cannot resolve it with one. I, I can't understand if you say don't. So that was um, that was the Chief Minister of Assam, Hemanta Biswa, Sarma, on 10th August. Uh, he kept insisting that these were issues that were difficult to understand from Delhi. Um, that a prior visit from the home by, by the Home Minister would fail to grasp, as he had said, quote, burden of history and jumping to quick fixes would miss, in his words, the complexity of this uh, legacy problem. He keeps using the word legacy a lot. So rather than name uh, Assam or Mizoram, I use the clumsy indicator National Highway 306 to gesture the underlying presumptions that frame my meditations this evening. It is clumsy because while the National Highway runs north to south, the region that we're talking about today is, uh, as a, in my paper is actually runs uh, east to west. Uh, and this terrestrial disorientation is intentional because uh, I intend to unsettle the categories that frame our webinar series this evening, uh, states, highways, borders, issues, which uh, prime fa fasci are modern phenomena. And yet as the CM uh, Biswasarma reminds us, the undercarriage of these phenomena is unmistakably pre-modern. And I, will, I would like to unpack this disorientation in, and then suggest at the end, hopefully, a few ways to think about moving forward. <clears throat> so I studied religions. Um, in my introduction, it was more like theology. But I, I studied religions as an aspect of culture. And I'm particularly interested in the narratives that we tell about others, 
about ourselves in, and how we signify on those, uh, on them in relation to other people, in relation to land, and sometimes maybe in the in relation to the physical, uh, metaphysical realm. It is with this orientation I participate on this webinar to examine the strands that conjure up phenomena such as Northeast India, issues inflected by border. And I start my excavation into these narratives with the leading jurist of Victorian England, Sir Henry Maine. And among the more influential ideas that he put forward, ancient law, uh, 1861, was it argued for the kinship basis of law in primitive societies, whereas in modern societies, there was a contractual and abstract relationship to law. So this binary signal, the shift from the Orientalist over-reliance on Sanskrit texts to unlock the minds and modes of being Indian. He advocated for observing Indians as they lived their lives rather than the wide Brahmanical lens a more, he was actually going for a more intimate and local understanding of native society. Additionally, Maine also critiqued the utilitarian focus on the essence and efficacy of laws in commands of the sovereign. It's not just the king who's issuing a, a law, but a few focused that overlooked rules of life drawn from local customs of their village and city. These two shifts in focus, commentaries agree endeared Maine more to anthropology than jurisprudence, the field that Maine actually represented. So even though he was talking about law, the anthropologists were more receptive to his, uh, his work. So Maine was a law member in the Viceroy's Council of India in 1861. His book, Ancient Law, came at a really critical time in the aftermath of the rebellion of 1857. Uh, 1857. And as the Raj in India charted a new course in co colonial governmentality, the British East India Company under the sway of Orientalists and uh, utilitarian ideas had effected direct rule focused on assimilation of the colonized elites. So you had the Rajas and Maharajas who became like Englishmen, if you remember Macaulay's minute. Rebellion and the pervasiveness of resistance to the company provided the impetus for reassessment of imperial policy. Maine's critique provided uh, an incisive diagnosis of the failure of his approach, of this approach, of the previous uh, uh, company's approach. The change in policy that Maine proposed would reconfigure colonial rule undergirded by a set of institutions, a racialized and tribalized historiography, a bifurcation between civil and customary law, and accompanying census that classified and enumerated the native population so that into so many natural groups. To be sure, the governmentality that Maine argued for was the seemingly the British Walton Chong because uh, post 1857, in her proclamation 1858, uh, Queen Victoria directed executors uh, officers of the crown to abstain from all interferences, especially with regard to private domain, especially the religious part. So Maine's ancient law, his book, articulated the finer points and broader implication of this uh, non-interference indirect rule. Now, indirect rule and Assam. So we've heard of this before. The Treaty of Yanabo lays a narrative backdrop for how Maine's ideas on indirect governmentality intersect with the main focus of this webinar. The Burmese king uh, of Ava seized Assam to British sovereignty. British expansion, as we've heard, included adjacent kingdoms, including the Kachar, the Khasi, Jantia. And by 1839, most of the region had ceded, seized, uh, ceded or lapsed to the British with tea gardens and prospecting for mineral resources on the uptick, the British attached uh, Assam to the provisional, uh, provincial administration of Bengal. And these expanding economic ventures required extensive labor. So you have, if you have uh, plantations, you need people to work on the plantations. So what did Assam do? Uh, they, the, the British brought in captive labor from India, primarily central India. So Assam at that time implied 
fuzzy belongings, uh, boundaries of belonging, fuzzy boundaries of belonging that included not only the local Ahom, but also the Kachari and Naga hill tribes, Marwari traders from Rajasthan, Indo-Aryan settlers, Bengali Hindu clerks, Nepali graziers, East Bengali Muslim traders and peasants. So it was a fuzzy boundaries of belonging and reifying Henry Main's template on, of indirect rule entailed at the most basic le level, defining these fuzzy boundaries of belonging. So post-rebellion 1857 onwards, Assam provided the lab, lab, laboratory for experimenting with indirect colonial rule. Uh, now, if you're a student of history, you know Cecil uh, Beden, the lieutenant, uh, lieutenant governor of Bengal, he, he agrees with the governor general, Lord Dalhousie, on British policy with regard to the hills, hill peoples. Um, the British administration would enforce a non-interference policy, 1851, and confine its efforts in, uh, to the plains, and then primarily to uh, keep in abeyance the incursions by the hill tribes. So what happens next is the work of the surveyors. The inner line system becomes emblematic of this policy of non-interference uh, as Maine's project of indirect rule worked out in British Assam. And we have the East Bengal Frontier Regulation 1873, Assam Frontier Tracks Regulation 1880, the Chin Hills Regulation 1896, Government of India Acts of 1919, 1935, all of these acts, they reinforce the dual administrative structure and exclusion of specific areas and peoples from governance structures. So even as the land was signified with uh, administrative zones, indirect rule required definition of the fuzzy and shifting boundaries of belonging. Defining these boundaries would order and enforce the exclusionary zones scarred into the landscape. So census and statistical data prove crucial to the narrative of indirect rule. Caste and tribe provided the grammar for classifying and ordering the fuzzy boundaries. But keep in mind, while Adivasi was used to denote the autochthonous the, uh, uh, communities in the region, it is now used primarily exclusively to denote the, the migrants from central India who came to work in the tea gardens. In the 1891 census, it switched from uh, 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 Adivasi to tribe to classify those indigenous communities of Assam. So however, unlike the Adivasi, the Bengalis, both the Muslim and the Hindu were identified as immigrants. Tribes inhabited the exclusionary zone so that geography rather than genealogy or history ordered belonging in the emergent colonial state. So pre-rebellion colonialism directly ruled through subjected elites. Post-rebellion indirect rule created relations between the native and the non-native. The complex ethno-political entity that emerged as British Assam created a triangulated relation between the native, the indigenous, or the tribal and the immigrant. So you have a triangulated relation between uh, native, tribal and immigrant. For the British rule to rule over an extensive territory inhabited by a mass of fuzzy belonging of its inhabitants, indirect rule meant uh, order, ordered boundaries, ordered identities, ordered relations of all that slipped between the definitions of rule. So rather than rehearse the recent border flare-ups, my focus has been on the narratives that help us imagine lines crossing terrestrial spaces and human uh, communities. Any discussion on the border issues, even in 2021, as we've heard uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, over this evening, they will invoke some aspect of the narrative that I've just delineated. Cases will be made for the slippages of in the colonial border formations. And from these slippages, there will be invocations of more recent developments to stake some position to thicken the issues. 
All this is to observe that the colonial governmentality persisted in the in post-colonial Assam in, and what is now the Northeast of India. Liminal spaces between co colonial definitions continue to instigate attempts to redefine, redefinition, often sadly, violently. And how might we decolonize our constructions, our analyses of these, as uh, Biswa Sarma puts it, legacy issues? So at an intellectual level, uh, the historian, the, the late historian Yusuf Bala Usman uh, from Nigeria, he's, he says that he, he, he provides a very helpful intervention. Um, he suggests a two-step. Firstly, proposing that, uh, presupposing that the past or history is written as a narrative. In other words, the past is not self-evident. Narratives require categories, concepts, and assumptions to reconstruct the past. Thus, if this first step is to engage the narrative tools consciously, or re we risk being captive intellectual prisoners, intellectual captives to certain presumptions and insecurities without ever being aware of it. The second step is to accept that we look at the, to the past from a vantage point of the present. Implicitly, every invocation of the past or legacy has implications for what we do today in the now, in the present. In other words, history is about the present. And the intellectual challenge is to engage the historicity of the concepts we use to narrativize the past. Long after uh, the British have gone, their imprints remain. The Mizoram Border Committee's resolution on July 30th uh, this year, this uh, recently, it invokes the concepts and the grammar of this legacy. Re resolution eight is, um, it's there. Now, the Boundary Committee intends to protect our land as it was occupied by our forefathers to its utmost ability and ask the people of Mizoram to so, uh, for their solidarity and support. The second person plural, uh, R, oversimplifies the history of migration with regard to our land, but then anchors the shifting identity onto a genealogy, our fathers. And according to the resolution one, the location determined by the inner line of 1875 is also a proverb, it's now the proverbial hill to die on. So there's this uh, rather oversimplification of the uh, unconscious engagement with the categories that we are playing with. So that's at the intellectual level of how we might decolonize our approach. At a more practical level, decolonizing also must move beyond the uncritical inversion of the binaries. If we are to capture the shifting identities, the slippages of how we signify on land, what might we learn from those who reside along those liminal spaces? Within a month of, after the, uh, well, with, within a few days after this resolution came out, the leaders of Vairingte Village Council met with their counterparts in Lailapur to eke out a bilateral solution. And keep in mind, this they did on their own without informing the chief ministers or, or the local uh, politicians. They did inform the police, their local police, about this meeting. So Raju Laskar was the former president of the Chandni Ghat Gao Panchayat when he led the team. At that time, he was no longer the president. Now he's infamous amongst his own social media users, in, especially in July. Uh, everyone knows Raju because he was taught, he was, according to his own social media, he instigated the flare up. But he was more reconciliatory when I spoke with him. Arl Alfankima is the chairman of the Vairangte Joint Village Council headed by heading the Mizo delegation to meet with Raju's team. Both Raju and Fampima agreed separately, when I spoke to them separately, that the border issue has to be resolved. There's no question about it. Both also agreed that they had no say on the issue because it had to be initiated by Gauhadi and Aizol, primarily at the chief minister level. However, both also agree 
that the border is not an end in itself. Rather, the end they envisioned was for people in the vicinity of Vairangte and Lailapur to resume the fluidity of movement and relations they shared mutually. The idea of neighborhood and neighbor, kanchenom, sorry, uh, non misos or hamare parosi, underscored their sense of mutuality. They kept they said kept saying those uh, tenom and parosi quite often. Raju was sensitive about the discourse among Mizo social media users who blamed the flare-up on Bangladeshis, quote-unquote uh, Bangladeshis, or the Muslim Bengalis in the area, as if uh, it, this is a trope, the Bangladeshi trope plays on the triangulated relationship between native, indigenous, and immigrant groups that emerged in post-colonial Assam. And unfortunately, Bangladeshi is a trope that infantilizes a complex cultural history and only stokes navel-gazing nationalism. Fumkima was more analytical. For him, armchair nationalistic fever from ISOL, people adrenaline pumped up rushing to the high stakes drama in their area did little for them there in Vairangte. He was critical of their saber rattling. You could see all those videos of guns being drawn by people from ISOL. He also questioned the practicality. Uh, this is something very important. He questioned the practicality of sticking to the 1875 frontier regulation, arguing that they themselves would be strangers if the demarcation held. Irrespective of where the border lines ran through, he longed for free movement of goods, services, and peoples a movement that stops whenever there is a, an escalation in tension. Meet uh, Subendra Namasudra, a mason who works in construction in Lunglei. Namasudra itself invokes a tortured century of migration between Bangladesh, Assam, Kolkata, even as the borderlines kept moving around. It also invokes, Namasudra invokes struggles for a place in caste Hinduism. Even as the reference place kept changing, he hails from Alipur close to Silchar, but moves in and out of Mizoram to trade his skills. And while unlettered and evasive on issues on border, he is he he expressed real content, I mean content with making a living in Mizoram. And he revels in the good relations he has with Mizos. Uh, Buena Omlo, he keeps telling me Buena Omlo, right? So in conclusion, borders manage movement and belonging. On the, the other hand, borderlands are a buzz with fluid mobility and negotiated identities. Histories are archived not in the colonial archives or modern libraries, but in the relations that persisted in spite of colonial definitions or political meta narratives of the modern nation state here in Mizoram too. Migration is subsistence. It is survival and negotiation for a living in relation wherever the next flare up will push them away. Henry Main provided the blueprint for a governmentality that put in the or in order and in of intersecting mass of people's interests and livelihoods this blueprint engendered categories would help us in 2021 to imagine discursive constructions, experience these constructions as if they are real. For example, Assam, Mizo, border, and so on. And yet these definitions fray because of the redefinitions within the frame of the nation state. Is there a way forward in these redefinitions of borders? A conscious, decolonizing intervention, I propose to close, is to listen to people like Raju, as much as we Mizos might hate him, to Fankima and to Subai, these discontents who did not cross the border, but who, as the Chicanas would tell you, who the borders crossed. Thank you. Hello? Yes. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Kima, for your insightful presentation. Uh, going all the way back, uh, uh, way back into the past, colonial past, and asking questions about how people were signified, the shiftings, fuzzy boundaries, and the ideas of belonging in the colonial times, questioning the dominant uh, narrative uh, of the boundary issues, the need for decolonizing our understanding of the complex issues involved, uh, which we often uh, simplify, and also the need to listen to people uh, uh, in the field. So thank you very much for your presentation. And so uh, now we will uh, uh, have our uh, second session, that's a discussion session. And we have a whole lot of questions here. And I think I'll just uh, read them out. Uh, so I guess we should start with uh, the questions addressed to uh, Professor uh, Dongil. Uh, sir, are you ready to take your questions? Hello, sir. Hello, Professor Dongil. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, so if you're ready, sir, I'll just read it out. Uh, the first question is from uh, Zo Sang Liana, MA third semester, political science department. So I'll just read it out. Uh, so he asks, in, 19, in 2019, the cabinet meeting, Mizoram government had made a clear statement on its stance on Mizoram, Assam border disputes, which is 1875 notification. But then the MNF, which is now the president, Sorry, but the then MNF, which is now the present government of Mizoram, had already accepted uh, NERA 1971 in the Peace Accord. So does 1971 NERA supersede 1875 notification? And is 1875 a reliable stand for Mizoram? That's his first question. Uh, yeah, so I'll go on to the next uh, once you finish. Okay. See, this has been widely circulated in social media than different political parties. And so to say, different social media warriors, different social media journalists and social media writers. But I would like to clarify that, please go through the Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971, how it is defined. It is mentioned territory of the then Lusai Hills, district of Assam. There is no specific mention of Lusai Hills with kilometer distance or area. It just mentioned territory of the then Lusai Hills of Assam. So it is very vague. There is no specific mention of the area of the Lusai Hills at that time. And I already mentioned about the 509 square males dispute going on. And under provision of six schedule, as district council is not authorized to control reserve forest. That reserve forest has been looked after by uh, forest department of Qatar DFO, but revenue from such area was given to Mizo District Council, 70%. And 30% remain with the Qatar Forest Division as administrative cost. So there is no specific mention of the area. It just mentioned Lusai Hills District at that time. In such a way, it can be interpreted that the disputed area can be covered or not covered. So it is very weak. That's why this cabinet resolution there is no point that uh, 1971 act hit the stop or 1971 act already put someone in awkward situation. It is not the case. That's why Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971 should be taken into account, should be looked properly, and there is no specific mention of the geographical area here. That's why there is no bar there is no restriction and there is no harder. That's what I would like to say. And due to that, many said that this 1971, the 1986 Mizoram Accord, but I would like to point out that there is no specific mention of the geographical area. And in, ad in addition to that, Mimi, I would like to clarify one point. 
as the time allotted was sought, I could mm -hmm. not explain things in detail. And in my, my concluding remark, I think I may be a little bit mistaken. If you go back to my remark, I didn't mention that Supreme Court and High Court cannot interfere in border dispute. I'm aware of the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in Article 131, but I was speaking in the context of Mizoram. Of course, Supreme Court can interfere. It is original jurisdiction. High Court also may interfere. But what I mean to say is that legal solution is not the best solution. Legal solution is better than polit uh, political solution is better than legal solution. See, earlier also Supreme Court litigate on many border dispute. But if the disputed state did not accept, it could not be enforced. There are precedents also. And even when border disputes among states or between states, have been taken up by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is not at all interested to litigate on border dispute. And even when Supreme Court issued guidelines, Supreme Court always mentioned that historical factors should be taken into account, then political dialogue mm. is the best solution. That's why Supreme Court does not unnecessarily want to, want to interfere in this border dispute. So Supreme Court can and Supreme Court may interfere and I don't mean that Supreme Court and High Court cannot interfere, but I'm speaking in the context of Mizoram and is the ongoing dispute. Legal solution is not the best solution. Political solution is better than legal solution. That's why I'm pointing out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dongyal, and, uh, and for the clarification as well. And uh, there are more questions for you, but we'll come back to you. Uh, now to uh, uh, Dr. Casey. Mm. Uh, Zosa, this is from Zosang Ahmar, and he asked, uh, his question is, what will be the immediate action that we can take, that can be taken by the government and by the people, in addition to that, what is the role of the people living in the border? So, yeah. Thank you. Over to Dr. Casey. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, this is the right time to have a talk. Not what we are in conflicts. And right now we are in a very peaceful state. But this is the right time to talk and to initiate a talk because when there is a flare up in the border, so, you know, it is very difficult when you are losing your tempers, right? But now we are in a very peaceful, yeah. uh, peaceful state. So this is the right time to coolly and calmly have a dialogue from both the, gov uh, from both the government. So based on the win-win situations. Right. So other ways, when there's a flare up, then there's a, another uh, media wars apart from the you know uh, uh, normal incidents. So that's why it is the right time to take step. So that is the immediate thing that I'd like to suggest. Okay. Thank you very much. And there's a further question. Uh, it, it's rather interesting. So I think uh, you should just uh, take this on again. And this is from Ruth Lal Ompui. And uh, so she asks, is it possible or do you think having cartographic war or pro propaganda war will solve our border issues, at least in some ways? Uh, so. Not at all, not at <laughs> all. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned that uh, this will rather ag can aggravate our problems and then the suspicions and you know, such kind of thing can be more. So what we can do is to try to make honest dealing on this issue. All right. Because ultimately we are human, we are very, you know, civilized now, we claim ourselves at this. So at that point, we should have some integrity also. So that's why this cartographic is actually, as I say, only after we clear the ground situations. Only after ground verification, we can use this cartographic. Only after that, we can make a, a boundary. Otherwise, if they don't agree, you can draw any lines. But if they don't agree, what is the use of it? So that's why I think this should be avoided. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is for uh, Ms. Kaute. And it's from Jimmy, uh, Department of History. Uh, he, his question is, could there be a constitutional amendment in the future, which is more equipped than Article 131 to deal and resolve uh, the interstate disputes? So uh, if Ms. Kaute, yeah. yes. 
Uh, of course, yes, because, uh, you know, the proviso to Article 131 was also brought about by an amendment, constitutional amendment, you know. So when I say that, what I mean to say is that the original text of the Indian Constitution did not have this proviso on the Article 131. So it was only after the 44th Amendment Act, you know, that was whereby this proviso was inserted, which kind of outstepped the Supreme Court's, uh, you know, jurisdiction to entertain cases, you know, which could arise out of border disputes, which and where the, you know, boundaries have already been, uh, you know, agreed upon through an accord or, you know, through some kind of an agreement. So, of course, we can always bring in an amendment, which needs to be, uh, which, you know, the amendment, the constitutional amendment can be brought through the special majority procedure that which I'm sure you're aware of. In fact, it's quite interesting to note, you know, that even regarding the CAA, you know, the Citizen Amendment Act, even in that instance, there's a jurisdiction of 131, you know, of the constitution also was challenged by Article 32 of the Indian Constitution. And Article 32 talks about the violation of fundamental rights. So, you know, although I think I missed out on saying that, although, uh, you know, 131 article doesn't uh, permit the Supreme Court to take over, you know, disputes, uh, which has been, like I said, agreed upon by an accord or by some kind of an agreement, written agreement. But we always have to remember that, you know, wherever there is a violation of fundamental right, you know, fundamental rights, Article 32 is always there for us. And also, you know, 136, especially petition, which means that if the Supreme Court considers it, adequately, you know, uh, possible to entertain such kind of cases, the Supreme Court can exercise its discretion. But having said that, you know, in all honesty, if you look at the uh, the Supreme Court or the judicial body, they exercise a lot of self-restraint when it comes to, you know, entertaining these kind of situations and cases, because, you know, when the, the law is already there, you know, whereby it, it on the face of it, prime emphasis, it says that, okay, do not entertain this kind of cases. But like I, you know, because like going back to the political theories where, you know, we try to follow the principles of separation of powers. So judiciary has always tried its best to restrain uh, from, you know, stepping into the domain whereby, you know, uh, the law of the land has already clearly stated that try to solve it by, you know, administrative, through the administrative bodies, because, you know, they are the ones who are in the, on the ground and they seem to be, you know, quote unquote, well equipped with what is actually happening, happening, you know, the ground reality rather than, you know, coming to us whereby we will only interpret the law. <laughs> so the role of the court uh, gets very, you know, uh, how do I say sandwich because the judiciary is there to interpret the law. So if at all there is a boundary dispute, like, you know, the, the way, the, you know, the, in the nature of what we are discussing today, these, uh, we already have a document, we already have the instruments, but the question now arises is, um, you know, and to also go back and validate or invalidate uh, these documents, you know, we have to go back in the past. And uh, so what is there before the court? Because the court is going to rule on the basis of evidences. So last year also, uh, Kerala state had also, you know, challenged the constitutional validity of Article 131. So perhaps, yes, I believe there will come a time when, you know, we need to have an amendment to Article 131 because border disputes, uh, unfortunately, have not been resolved either through negotiations. And if the uh, documentation of these boundary, uh, you know, uh, issues, in, especially in the Northeast, was so clear and was so unambiguous, then I don't think this issue would have you know, come up in the first place. So certainly, yes, we can introduce uh, an amendment can be introduced through the special majority procedure that's there. So the answer is yes, in the affirmative, yes. Thank you very much. And uh, the next question is for uh, Dr. Larwat Kima. Uh, the question is from Elizabeth. And her question is, uh, would it be fair to say that on both sides, there is an interplay of history, memory and land use intertwined with cultural values along the disputed areas between Kachar and Mizora? Hmm. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And the answer is yes. Um, short answer, you want a long answer? I'll give you an example. Um, uh, so if you listen to the Biswa Sarma's interview from August 10th, uh, there's one part where he says, uh, you know, people are saying that I'm doing this just because I'm going for the vote. Uh, um, the Muslim vote and all that stuff. But he says, in that area, there's so many Muslims and none of them gave me their votes. So here's the, the twist. I, when I spoke to Raju, as, as much as Mizos don't like him, uh, 
he's a bjp guy and so i asked mm. him hey raju uh, that's strange huh? you're muslim but you are you know a bjp guy and he's he boasts about getting a thousand votes and so mm. i said how is that possible uh, does nrc ca and all isn't that uh, pitted against the muslims he said no uh, we are bengali muslims we've been here for centuries we uh, we've been here I was born here my father was born here my grandfather was born here and uh, we've been here for generations and in fact where we are standing where i live right now what well, karim ganj now used to be bangladesh so he's signifying on that history the memory of a time before um, before uh, all these boundaries these borders came into um, became uh, part of our political uh, consciousness and signifying on that he he says um, yeah um we why would a muslim come from bangladesh when bangladesh is a muslim dominant country and it made a lot of sense so he's signifying on his on their own community's memory but placing themselves not as immigrants which was the triangulated relationships that came that came up in the uh, post uh, colonial assam modern nation state but actually playing on that and for example so amongst within our own mizo uh, uh, communities um, we have all our you know so there's the problem of uh, linking identity to location because we all say we are zone hat hak and we are all this uh, uh, is this fuzzy belonging to a past a memory uh, but where does my misoness end so that for example your cookiness starts and it has to a lot to do with location and that okay. is a, a a continuation of that legacy which is why i thought that uh the the decolonizing part was important for any step forward um yes we all say yeah the, we, the, these are all uh, layovers of a colonial past and and we we have this bogeyman back in the uh, in our mindsets whenever these issues come up and we try to wax eloquent about it at the same time we don't make the step to decolonize it and the best decolonize is to accept that all of us do that interplay of signifying meaning making on memory and histories and if we are doing that how is it that we can move forward and as uh, mary uh, my co-panelist said we should uh, stakeholders she talked about students and youth uh, i would go further stakeholders of people who are actually on those borderlands um what are they talking about uh, how are they signifying their own uh, situation in life but also situation in, in life in relation to the the um it's like an ephemeral uh, border that exists in everyone's mind but you don't see it there and how are they you know signifying on that in relation to how they survive how they live on mm. the best that came out was kanchanamte and hamare porosi that's something that we need to think seriously mm-hmm. rather than uh, adju- ad- uh, 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 adjudicate from our academic armchairs political armchairs but actually see what's happening in, in those so yes definitely everyone's mm-hmm. doing it everyone is signifying on memory and all place all of that so the answer is again yes thank you Thank you very much that's very interesting and we will go back to uh, professor Dongyal and uh, the question is by Zosang Ahmar so he, uh, his question is on the 23rd July 2021 Assam and Meghalaya chief ministers had a meeting in Shillong regarding their border disputes they have three proposals or strategy uh, which is number 1 history facts uh, historical facts number 2 administrative convenience and thirdly sentiments of local residents and continuity so his question is will it be effective to adopt this kind of strategy in mizoram yeah the same strategies have been posed 
and the same strategy have been mobilized from the part of government of Mizoram and also from the proposal of the Boundary Commission also. So it is in the process. Okay. That's all I can say. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I think, so you should uh, take this question uh, again. <laughs> Sorry, okay. uh, there's another one. Uh, the question is uh, from Tuang Atamte, and his question is, though there have been many negotiations through different, uh, at different levels uh, of the government officials, no solution has, can be seen till date, and can this be the real intention of the Assam government in not solving the border dispute and continue on to forcefully expand as long as they can? No, the matter is, is now taken up by Ministry of Home Affairs. Mm -hmm. And in a short while from now, maybe at any time, the team engaged by the Ministry of Home Affairs is likely to visit Assam, Mizoram, and other states also. And let's hope that through that, some uh, amicable solution may come up. And for solving these vexed political problem from both sides, certain give and take may be necessary to come to the negotiating table. And now the Ministry of Home Affairs is taking up and it is in the process. Let's hope that something may, some positive development may come out of it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before we go on to the next question, uh, I would really encourage everyone to fill up the uh, feedback form, which has been posted in the comment section. That is uh, so that we will be able to generate your e-certificate as soon as possible. And uh, the next question is for Dr. Casey. And the question is from Lalfak Omar. And his question is, how did the British during their rule measure the, border, uh, the boundary lines between Mizoram and, and Assam? How did they measure it? And is there any change? And, he's also, his, and he also asks, GIS mapping may be able to solve the dispute. Will GIS mapping able to solve the dispute? Yes. These are very good questions. Uh, as far as uh, British uh, you know, period is concerned, generally they are using natural boundaries. That means rivers or mountain ranges. So that is how they use. And as I say, in then the transformation of landscape and terrains are so much now, okay? So during that time, they have very small technology like GIS or geotacking and all. So this GIS may not help, as I say, only ground verification, even that based on the agreement of the two, you know, uh, stakeholders of the two states. Only we can solve it. GIS is, as you please remember, GIS is the thing. It is a tool. It is a tool. Okay. According to you, you can just draw, you know, draw this side and draw that side. That's it. Yeah. It does not make any sense. It's up to you. The human mind is much more important. So mm -hmm. I think that's how I can answer. Okay. Is it okay? <laughs> Yes, I, I'm sure uh, the, the person who asked the question is quite satisfied with that. That's a really good answer. And uh, there's another question for uh, Ms. Kaute. Uh, it's from Zo Sang again. Mm, the question is, the 509 square miles, which was originally, which originally belonged to Mizoram, which was, which originally belonged to Mizoram, and we've heard that the revenue was given to Mizoram till uh, Mizoram became a uh, union territory. Out of the 509 square miles, it seems that more than half of it are now in Assam. What will be your suggestion to take back the entire 500 mile, uh, square miles, which was ori which originally belonged to us? So how are we going to take it back? <laughs> See, uh, I have the limitations because, uh, like I said, you know, being from the legal department, I will... Uh, the only answer that I can give you is that we need to go through the you know, legal procedure. But I think this question uh, would be more aptly addressed by our uh, Professor Dongil because I quite clearly remember he said that, you know, the solution is better if you try to seek it through the political means rather than the legal means. 
So I, I think uh, Professor Dongil can come in my rescue because, you know, when you talk about these, uh, you know, the, when you put out facts like this, like, you know, 509 miles uh, belong to Mizoram, now it's under Assam and, you know, how do you take it all of, all of it back? So, um, well, you know, there is uh, no solution that I can tell you, okay, this is the method because we need to follow the law of the land. And now the question is that what, you know, what is the law that we're going to follow in it? Because each party is going to lay their stake, right? So it has to come through an amicable solution because the union government is not going to come and tell you that, you know, Assam, give back all of these because these are based on historical facts and figures, you know? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, and that's what is exactly happening with this boundary dispute is because it's been left for us to decide on mutual consent, on mutual understanding. And when you talk about agreements, it's consenting of minds. So the only solution that I actually can think of is through a mutual agreement, which has not really happened. So that's the reason why the question lingers on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. So it's a very open ended question, you know, which don't really seem to have an answer. Mm. Uh, would uh, Professor Dongyal uh, like to comment on that? Sir? Yes. See, in this regard, there is nothing much to com uh, to comment. Mm -hmm. And as we know, some part is now under Assam and some part under Mizoram. And as I've said, for solving any border dispute, up to some extent, give and take may be required from both sides. It may not be completely as far the view of Assam and then would be completely as far the view of Mizoram. Then in such a way, if the Home Ministry Government of India negotiated, and like as it is a vexed political problem, overnight solution may not be possible, but anything can be solved and anything can be taken up through political dialogue. It may take time. So it may not be appropriate to give concrete reply to this and for the this process is going on. That's how I can say. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, yeah, the next question is for Dr. Larwat Kima. It is from uh, Shangswana, Department of History. And the question is, sir, you have highlighted the complexity of borders where people and cultures need to be considered. And it is in fact the borders that actually cross the people. So from your argument, is it possible to resolve our border issue? I'm just, uh, as Simon and Garfunkel would put it, I'm just a poor boy. Um, and I don't think I can solve it. But as people like Fumkima uh, pleaded with me, says, could you, wh whatever platform you are speaking on, press on people, impress people that the border needs to be solved. Like I said in, the, in my presentation, the border itself is not an end for themselves. For them, they just want it to be solved because the larger end that they are, that comes across when I talk with both Raju and uh, Fumkima is that, um, they want to normalize relations, relations that have persisted even through uh, the, the, uh, the flare-ups, the occasional flare-ups this year, last year onwards um, that have continued. And there's this, uh, um, what's the word? Um, mutuality about the, the way they've, they've they're, lifestyles have evolved. For example, um, the Mizo side go down into the area to pick up the chenkol um, because the Muz uh, they don't eat them. Uh, they don't like that. So that's a, a really important source of chenkol that you see in Aizol and other places. Uh, stuff like that. And then it happens the other way around. A lot of the labor, people like uh, Subhai, we Mizos depend on these skilled laborers uh, for the work. And so there's this mutuality that is unwritten, that is not in the constitution. We, uh, we invoke uh, uh, 
me mechanisms of the government, tools and offices of the government, and this, uh, which is really high up there. And to think deconstructively is to actually get off those uh, tools and offices, those uh, machinery that we're so used to adjudicate, to administer for us, get off those and listen to people who are actually, um, you know, negotiating life, even as we are having this webinar. So is it possible to resolve our border issues? It's really up to people who, it, for us, it is, we need, we need to raise the voice that the border needs to be uh, resolved. But keep in mind for people on the border, it's yes, they want that, but that's not in the end in itself. Uh, they just want to continue living, right? Which is a very basic human instinct. Uh, mm. And uh, so keeping that in mind, um, how can this webinar push, and I know my co-panelist is on the border committee and we've, the committee has come down hard on 1875 and then you have people on the border saying, maybe 1875, yeah, it's all good, but uh, we will be strangers if the borders, the land persisted. I mean, if 1875 continued. So there's an issue that there's some uh, humility about the stance that we take and to be negotiating. Uh, all of us, the all the panelists, we talk about negotiating, but negotiating means, um, you know, letting go of some things that we hold dear, mm -hmm. something that is more adrenaline rush because it talks about who we are and whatever that means. Keeping in mind all of that, what we are is they are discursive constructions of history that uh, we negotiated them over history and we continue to signify on them even today. Um, mm. If we are aware of that and then negotiation becomes a lot more practical. Mm. So um, what, I, what I'm suggesting and pushing it towards the end of my presentation is not so much this is how to do it, but this is the mindset we need to, might mm. need to have in order to approach to start working towards tangible, uh, realizable solutions to this whole issue, right? So mm. um, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. It made me think a lot and actually think beyond what I wanted to say in my paper. And so, yeah, thanks again. Uh, oh, is it Swana, is it who asked me that question? Thanks, great question. Yes, Shantana, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kima. And uh, I'll make a, I think uh, we can end our uh, discussion session there because it's rather late now. And, but before that, I'll just make a brief comment uh, from uh, reading out the questions. And uh, what I've noticed is that uh, what really comes to my mind is the kind of relationship that uh, since most, uh, that we uh, maybe as a Mizo community have with the Indian state is I think, uh, that really comes out for me. I think that's really interesting. I think it's important uh, that uh, we, we look into that. And uh, also the other thing is uh, all our pre presenters really dwell on people, on practicalities, on uh, things happening in the field. And so they all take a very humane approach. And I think that's really practical. And that is really the need of the hour. So thank you very much to all our presenters. And I... And all my colleagues are really appreciative of all your inputs. And okay, uh, sorry, I think there is another one here. Uh, sorry, I, I'll just... Uh, so someone says that I have not raised uh, his question. Uh, okay, I want to be fair, I'm just going to go back. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you like to uh, type in your question again, Mr. Larvin Nungahmar, please, uh, while I make some uh, uh, while I uh, make some announcements? Uh, another thing is, I would like to encourage you again to uh, fill up 
the feedback form so that we can send you your e-certificates. And also another thing is, this is a week long webinar. And because of that, uh, let me just share something here. We, uh, the webinar continues throughout this week. Uh, sorry. Just hold on. Yeah, so I'm just going to share something on the screen. Please bear with me. Yeah. So uh, we have Youth and Mental Health Contemporary Issues and Emerging Responses webinar uh, on the 27th, 27th of October and on Tourism for Inclusive Growth on the 28th. And on the, twin, and on the same day, we have Embracing Artificial Intelligence in Health, Education and Business. So please register for these uh, webinars if you're interested. And uh, let's go back to Mr. Lalin Nunga. Okay, uh, sorry, we'll just take on this last question since he has requested it again to Professor Dongel. Uh, he talks about our, uh, if there are any dispute between Mizoram and Tripura, uh, he would like uh, Professor Dongel to elaborate on that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nunga, for your concern. Actually, yeah, there is some border issue between Mizoram and Tripura, then Tripura and Assam also. But I have touched only some of the burning border issue, taking into account the time allotted to us. That's why I do not touch everything in detail. And even in my lecture also, I just did it in shortcut method. Due to that, I'm not touching on it. Not only Mizoram and Tripura, even between Tripura and Assam also, some issue is there. But as I've mentioned, I touch only the ongoing burning issue. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dongyal. I hope uh, Mr. Rinnung is satisfied now. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you very much once again. It's rather late, but uh, thank you so much for Hi, having been here. And now I- Is it Clive, Yes, it's a bit late now. And uh, now I will call upon uh, our academic coordinator, Dr. Lal Thanpuyi Silo, to propose a vote of thanks. Okay. On behalf, uh, am I audible? Yes. On behalf of the departments of history, geography, and political science, I thank everyone who participated in tonight's session. Our esteemed resource persons have enriched our knowledge with their different perspectives on border issues in Northeast I India and left us with many points to ponder upon. So thank you, Professor Dongil, Dr. K.C. Lalma Somzawa, Ms. Mercy K. Khaute, and Dr. Lalruat Kima. Once again, thank you all and good night. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.